Okay, we're live now. Uh, good evening, everybody. Again, thank you, uh, Barry Lewis, Village Administrator. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. As many of you are aware, our village charter, which is something I think we're all very proud of, one of the things that makes South Orange unique, specifically provides in Article 4.4a that the village president is to annually report on the state of the village and the work of the previous year. And that's what brings us here tonight. It's a tradition that um, Village President Torpy has sort of brought back to make it a, I think, a more formal presentation than had been done in the past. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, your Village President, Alex Torpy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, all right, so before we kind of get into everything here, there is a little exercise that I, uh, I wanted to, uh, to go through, just so everybody can be familiar with everybody else that's in the room. Um, so the first round, uh, could I have all the trustees please stand? <laughs> um, so Walter Clark, Sheena Collum, Deborah Davis Ford, Howard Levison, Mark Rosner, and Steve Schnall, can we please give them a round of applause? Stay, stay standing, stay standing, um, get comfortable, you're going to be standing for just a minute. Um, so I want to make sure to thank them, for all of them, not just for being here, but for also all of the amazing work that they've done um, over the past year. Um, so you've met Mr. Lewis, uh, our village administrator, um, and along with our deputy administrator Adam Lerner and Kathy Cameron in administration, who helped coordinate this, they m make up our administration office. And could we have uh, Mr. Lewis stand up as well? Um, and now I'd like to go through and ask all of our department heads that are here tonight um, to stand as well. So everybody, everybody stay standing. So I want to go through and make sure you know who's here. So this is in administration, Barry Lewis and Adam Lerner, um, our building department Tony, uh, run by Tony Grenchy. The clerk's office, our clerk Susan Caljean um, and deputy clerk Chanel Smith. Our engineering department, Sal Renda. Our fire department, Acting Chief Dan Sullivan. Our health department, John Festa. Our IT department, Stan Wilkinson. Our library, Melissa Kopecki. In our police department, we have Chief Jim Shalell and Captains Kyle Kroll and Ed Heckel. Our public works director, Tom Machetti. Recreation director, Kate Schmidt. Our tax assessor and purchasing agent, Ellen Malgiri. Our tax collector, Ronki Zacchaeus. Our, our South Orange Village Center Alliance Executive Director, Bob Zuckerman. Our South Orange Parking Authority Executive Director, Mark Hartwick. And our South Orange Performing Arts Center Director, Mark Packer. Um, and our Rescue Squad, uh, President Melanie Troncone. And I think we have First Lieutenant Scott Egelberg as well. If you guys could all please stand up. And could we please give a round of applause to all these folks. And if there's, if, there's any other, if there's any other staff, if there's any other village staff here, um, please stand up as well. Um, and now, anybody who volunteers on any committee or any board, also please stand up. And please give a round of applause. So, before everybody sits down, these are just a small slice of some of the people in town that do all of the amazing work that we're going to talk about over the next hour. So please give another round of applause to all of these great people. You may be seated. <laughs> uh, and I know we have uh, some other folks as well. I want to make sure to recognize uh, Myla Jacy, Assemblywoman from our district, who's here tonight. Uh, Tracy Gottlieb, the Vice President of Student Affairs from Seton Hall University. Uh, John Amato, the President of the Chamber of Commerce. All right, so we've got a lot of great folks here tonight, um, and I want to make sure that before we did start, that you just had a sense of how many people in this community are involved in creating this community, and that's something that we're going to talk um, a little bit about tonight. Um, but before we really dive into everything, um, we're at a point in our time when it has become increasingly easy to measure things. We have more data, more algorithms, more technological capacity to measure things than we've ever had before. And it's important with all of that data to sometimes to step back, take a little bit of perspective, and actually think about what it is we are trying to measure. By using the data that's kind of available to us, what's easy to find, Sometimes I think it's possible that we overlook the bigger picture. 
It's not just about the numbers, it's about something more than that. And sometimes it might be possible that based on our, um, the convenient access that we have to certain types of data, that sometimes we miss other things. Sometimes we think we're measuring something completely when in fact we're actually just measuring a very small part of it and leaving out something else. Um, so tonight what I want to try and do is offer all of you the most complete picture possible to the performance of the village government and to the state of the village. Um, and so before I dive in, I want to make a distinction. Um, and this distinction underpins our ability to get a complete picture of this quality of government and the state of the village. So there's actually two different governments and two different villages that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, one is state of the village with a lowercase v. Um, and this is a government with a lowercase g. This is the government that we're all very familiar with and can easily recognize. This is the government buildings, the staff, the payroll, the interactions, all the services. This is a police officer responding to your 911 call. This is your child participating in a program at the Baird. Um, this government will find is much easier to measure. This is the institution of government. You could also think about this as the output. But we can't make the mistake of thinking that understanding just that will give us a complete picture of what we want to know tonight, which is the state of the village, not just the state of the operations of the institution of village government. That does not make up the whole picture. So the second half of this is the government with a big G or the village with a big V. Um, this is government, the idea, the concept, the philosophy, and the culture of government. It's inclusive of every single one of us, every person, every entity in South Orange and outside of South Orange whether they mean to be participating or not. It's the entire ecosystem where people, thoughts, ideas come together, they get set into priorities, they get codified into laws. All of those discussions, the arguments, the fears, people's desires about what they want to do, that entire ecosystem is made, um, makes up this bigger G government. Um, this is not a physical thing. It has no institutions or no buildings, no employees or contracts. This is the idea of government, the idea of using collective and publicly accessible systems to codify values, priorities, and rules through democratic means in an attempt to provide equity, justice, progress, innovation, safety, and opportunity. We can think about this part of the government not just as a bigger picture, but also as the input. It's a little bit harder to measure, it's a little bit harder to talk about, um, but it's no less important. But before we do get to kind of the big pie in the sky abstract, which as most of you who probably know me, that is where my head lives most of the time. Um, we're going to start with the little g government, the government that's more easily recognizable, um, that we all see and interact with um, on a daily basis. So the first area that I want to start at is what you can see of the government. In South Orange, we've been recognized statewide, regionally, and nationally for setting an example on how to be transparent in government. We don't have enough time tonight to go over every single thing we've done in this regard, but there's a couple areas that I do want to draw your attention to. So not only do we continue to post budget information on the website, as has been done in the past, but we do so with a mind towards not just what we share, but how we share it. And now taking that information, that budget information, and releasing it as raw data that you can download in a spreadsheet, you can edit, you can manipulate, you can play around with however you want. And as of 2013, taking that and putting it into a financial reporting system that allows you to look at five years of budget data, go back, visualize it, run reports, just like we would do. So ideally, the idea is that you can see where your money is going in as clear of a way as possible. Um, and that you can get a solid understanding, as solid of an understanding of our budget and finances as we have. And beyond that, for 2015, I've added $25,000 into the budget that's been presented to the trustees for a citizen-guided budget line. It's a small pot of money that residents will get the chance to decide where it goes, whether they want it right back in their pockets as a tax refund or towards a new program or to supplement an existing program. This will not only give residents complete direct access to making a budget decision, but it will show us, the elected officials, as representatives where our community's priorities lie by giving them that very direct access to show us. This will be done um, if passed in the budget through the Peak Democracy software platform that we've purchased for the purpose of online engagement with our community. The Peak Democracy platform is one of several engagement and communication initiatives that's come out of and coming out of the Public Information and Marketing Committee. 
which is a group where with the assistance of a couple of village officials, residents are helping direct projects that will help our village be not only better branded, but do a better job communicating inside of South Orange and outside of South Orange, an area that we're gonna come back to in a little while that we all know we need to improve on a little bit. In our board meetings, we've made some simple changes that actually have major impacts, such as rotating the order of things that are voted on so that each vote starts with the next person in line. The way that it's usually done and the way it used to be done is someone always votes first and someone always votes last, which is a little bit of an advantage for one person and a little bit of a disadvantage for somebody else. We also added a second comment period, public comment period to our meeting, so there's an opportunity for the public to speak before we take action and after we take action. And unlike many towns in South Orange, we try our best that no matter what the comment is during the meeting, we try our best to address it right then and there and don't let any comment go um, without having some sort of answer, even if we have to get back to the person afterwards. Um, we had a leadership summit at Seton Hall University um, that was organized by students there. And one of the conversations that we had with students was what was their experiences with civic engagement. One of the experiences that was talked about from the students during that meeting was the idea that if you go to a government and you have an idea or you have a complaint or you have a question or you have a comment and you make that and you make all the effort of going to one of these meetings and nobody responds to you, that's a pretty big disincentive to wanting to be further involved. Um, and so as myself and all of the board members we don't want that attitude to be here in South Orange. We want people to, there are plenty of ways to get involved, some of which we're gonna talk about, but even when people do come to the meeting, make that comment, we should address that um, as, best, as best we can. Um, and that's an important culture that um, I think we have here. All the trustee committee reports now are asked to be in, are usually outlined ahead of time. So that if you want a quick update on what a committee is doing, you don't necessarily have to go to the meeting and watch it. You can see some of the bullet points ahead of time. You can decide at that point whether that's enough or whether you do want to go to the meeting and learn more, or ask a question, or make a comment. Um, the process by which agenda items um, are submitted um, also changed where instead of things being submitted by basically a one sentence in an email, um, we have a web form that people use that now is used without incident. There was a lot of difficulty getting that started. Um, and that form requires some background, supplemental information, a little context, um, and any backup materials that might exist. And I think we all now understand that that helps provide people a little, the trustees a little more information and members of the public a little bit more information about items that are gonna be discussed in upcoming board meetings. My official office hours every week have been attended by, at last count, 160 people since starting, and hundreds more my unofficial office hours, which is me just doing work down at Starbucks. Um, and that accessibility is something that I've certainly gotten tremendous feedback from residents about. And that is something that our entire board of trustees has adopted. You cannot, it's almost impossible to go to an event around town and not run into one of our trustees who's not only there ready to represent the village in their role as a trustee, but also to take information back to the rest of the group about whatever was going on at that particular event. Um, we saw this after Hurricane Sandy with neighborhood meetings, and we see this now on Irvington Avenue around a lot of public safety concerns, one that just was passed in an ordinance tonight, um, and now a lot with senior citizens as well. Trustees are out around town at events, and not just for the fun of it to shake hands, but they're actually working. They're taking information back from suggestions they get in these events back to the governing body, and some of those are becoming policy. We also launched our 311 service, um, SO Connect which is powered by public stuff, which is fielded as of tonight over 2,200 requests for service. And what SO Connect does is connect citizens directly to the departments responsible for fixing or, or, or servicing whatever that complaint is without requiring to go through an elected official to necessarily get it done. Go, going that route slows the process down a little bit. You're creating a longer email chain. It gives these volunteer elected officials who are already very busy even more work to do. It confuses the department heads as far as what priorities go where, as far as work coming in. And it actually encourages, not really in South Orange, but in general, that type of transactional relationship with elected officials encourages political favoritism that we don't want to see here. Um, so SO Connect. Um, is you can download it in the Android or um, iTunes store or go to the website at southorange.org slash 301. And this was featured recently on CBS, on News 12, on Fios, mostly in related to snow removal requests that we're getting. The idea there is that we're connecting people much more directly to the people who they need to talk to. 
Um, and there's many more. One of my favorites, which is very simple, which is just trying our best to explain extremely complicated issues to people. Whether we can appease their request or not, the number of times that we've communicated with residents, especially probably road paving, is one of the biggest ones where it's a very complex process. Um, and the process that we have has been kind of uh, created over time to make it the most objective possible. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to be happy with the result. But what it does mean is that as a resident, you can understand and see that the process is fair, and that it's equitable, and that somebody isn't getting special treatment over you. Everything's going into the work queue the same way that anybody else's request would. Um, and so whether it's the order of the roads getting paved, or why we're switching water companies, or anything like that, we've done our best job to try and make the entire process clear to people and let people in on our decision making. And that is worth at least one reminder, which is South Orange will be finally switching away from East Orange Water Commission um, and will, excuse me, be using New Jersey, American, uh, New Jersey American Water instead, a decision that years of work has gone into and will benefit all of us in future generations. Um, now before I move on to the next topic, there's an important distinction I want to make here. Um, this is not the kind of distinction that typically helps you win a re-election. Um, but to take some words from President Obama, I have no more campaigns to run. Um, there is a big difference between personal accessibility and accountability and institutional accessibility and accountability. There are plenty of mayors out there who will give their cell phone numbers to anybody who wants it and set up job interviews for people that ask them for that to just take care of issues that come in one by one in a reactionary um, and transactional but indeed a very responsive way trying to make individual people happy as these issues arrive, as, as they arise. But that's not really the kind of government that I believe in. Um, sure, I've given my cell phone number out publicly during the storms and whatnot, but me answering the phone trying to fix that problem doesn't actually fix the underlying problem. It doesn't advance the institution of government. It advances the political actor individually with the institution riding on their coattails. Now, there's no doubt that some people have probably found me less than what they expect a typical politician responsiveness to be. But I'm not interested in that side of it, you know, making endorsements during campaigns or going to political events or taking personal phone calls when it's more appropriate for a staff person to handle that. Nor am I trying to necessarily make each individual person happy every single time we get a request in. Rather, the job of the public institution is to make decisions that perform the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. I've been emailed and asked about jobs in town, and people just get a link to the page on the website that lists the jobs. And, those, and if there's a job where I happen to know an applicant, I'm specifically staying out of it, not inserting myself into it. I'm not interested in anyone doing me favors, nor am I interested in giving any out to anyone. I'm interested in a government that makes people happy because the government works well and people understand that it works fairly. Transactional political environments often encourage people to actually create an over-reliance on themselves as political actors, sometimes by mistake, and some to guarantee their future in the organization. I've done everything I can do to try and create the opposite of that culture, and instead to ensure that anything that we do that's positive in town, we do as an institution, not on the shoulders of one elected official or another. To that end, we've tried to make, and I think successfully so, our entire government more accessible, more transparent, more accountable, and more responsive. You shouldn't need to know an elected official to get something done, get an answer to a question, or anything like that. That's, again, not the kind of government I believe in, and I don't think it's the kind of government that our founding fathers intended. Requesting service from the Department of Public Works is not a political issue, and it shouldn't be one. By creating a 311 system, for example, to route those complaints directly to the people that need to fix them, you can remove the idea that having a political connection helps get you any further along in that process. The services get distributed faster because it's more efficient, and we get to collect data on the performance of how those services um, are delivered. That's an issue near and dear to all of us, trying to figure out a way to measure our performance, which you can't do if I call someone on their cell phone and ask them to fix a pothole on my street. And in fact, Trustee Levison, who chairs the Finance and IT Committee, is working with our administration right now, setting some of those performance benchmarks using the 301 system so that we can figure out how to continue to improve those in the future. 
So what we're doing here tonight and in general, it isn't about me or any one of us as elected officials. It's not even about what we can do just this year or what we can do before the next election cycle. It's about the greater good of this organization serving the greater good of this community, not just now, but for all of those who will come after. This organization should be able to continue to use those values to guide its progress, whether I'm here or whether any of our current elected officials are here or not. In my opinion, a good leader instills these values in an institution and the culture and actually almost makes themselves obsolete in doing so. It's a topic that we cover in the class that I've started to teach at Seton Hall, and I think it's a topic, again, worth bringing up here because it rarely is talked about in a public setting like this. Now, although I may be the face of transparency for South Orange or anything else that occurs, good or bad, just because I'm the top elected official, the focus this entire time has been building the institutional capacity and culture towards that. And to credit to all those people who stood up in the room before and the staff members who aren't here, I believe we have done that. And our government will only continue to find ways to be more accessible. Whether it's Trustee Chenal's initiatives to get more volunteers involved and organize how we do that kind of outreach better than we do currently, and finally put together a dynamic online discussion forum where we can engage with our residents through that, Trustee Collins' efforts at coordinating major improvements to how we meet the needs of senior citizens or supporting our police department's community engagement practices or Trustee Rosner's work with the Development Committee and helping involve experts in the process of productively contributing ideas towards our future redevelopment. There is so much work going on that is transparent, participatory, and productive, and that is available to anybody who lives in this town and wants to add value. To help ensure that this continues that way and isn't just informally done, um, I'll be introducing an ordinance to the board shortly uh, that I wrote with the help of the Citizens Campaign, the Sunlight Foundation, several other elected officials, and our professional staff to go through trustee committees and then be presented to the board, which for the first time possibly in the entire state of New Jersey takes all of these best practices that we know are the right things to do and puts it into law so that everybody who follows us knows what is to be expected of them from a transparency standpoint. So for example, re requiring that the disclaimer that we've added to all of our outgoing emails that just let the resident know, by the way, this email communication is actually public, is a public document, which most people don't know. Um, it will require the village president to do their best job to respond in every board meeting to any of the comments public that were made during the public feedback session. It will require information to be stored in more accessible, searchable formats making open requests um, easier to do, and there's much more that will go into that ordinance. So transparency is obviously very important to all of us. Anyone running for office will say transparency is important, but they're usually talking about themselves being transparent, whereas what we have done here is made our institution transparent. And that will outlive any one of us, and that's something that I think is a real accomplishment. Um, so moving on, we want to talk a little bit about our budget and finances. <laughs> Taxes, for as long as I can remember, and probably most of you can, um, some of which might be a longer memory than me, um, have been incredibly high in South Orange. For the municipal portion, we have only a limited ability to make a major impact as we only receive about 28% of that property tax dollar that a homeowner pays. And much of that 28% is locked into fixed costs and bills we get, salaries for employees that are contractually negotiated, Insur insurance premiums that we get a bill for, utility costs, and other items, again, excuse me, that we have very little control over. But even so, last year's tax increase was the lowest in over 15 years. And we're on track to do the same for 2015, hopefully under 1% or just right around there. In fact, you can see the tax levy increases 2011, 2012, 2013, and 14 were all the lowest increases as far back as 1999. Every year, the increases are going down. And we've gotten to a place where we've not only stabilized the budget, but with the number of new properties that are revenue positive that will be coming on board over the next couple years in the downtown, the village will be in an even better position, not even just to reduce the increases, but maybe to start chipping away at your actual property taxes. Now, as I mentioned, costs are hard to cut, especially without cutting services that we all know are the, one of the hallmarks of living in South Orange. So an enormous amount of focus has been put on generating new revenue, which as a local government is actually one of the few areas where we actually have a pretty good ability to make some progress there. But it didn't come easy. Our staff, most notably in the building and engineering departments, are incredibly responsive to developers, business owners, and property owners. And our land use boards 
are now working with applicants to make sure that they get their projects done, but within our guidelines. In the last four years, including both projects that have been completed and projects not underway, not including several projects that are still a little too early to count in this number and not including the enormous amount of individual renovations store owners have put into their storefronts in the downtown. Just looking at redevelopment in the downtown of South Orange, we brought in $164 million. Um, that number is a big one. This is also a conservative calculation. This does not include three projects that I would be speaking a little too soon if I included that number right now in that, and it doesn't include millions of dollars that new businesses and existing businesses have put into renovating their existing storefronts. Um, and what's amazing is these redevelopment projects, it's not, there's a few benefits, right? There's one, which is we get to provide homes for people to live in this community. That's an amazing thing to be able to do is to literally create a home for somebody in this community that we value so much. And it isn't just for foot traffic to all the businesses in the downtown, but this increase in rateable base, this is a very important thing as far as our financial outlook. The Third and Valley Project, for example, and hopefully everybody's seen it going, they are even in the coldest days, I don't wanna go outside, they're out there working. That will provide 255 public parking spaces an increase of around 70 public spaces, more than we had before, 215 apartments, with 21 of those on-site affordable apartments, which will be the first new on-site affordable units in South Orange, in the downtown, which we are just absolutely thrilled about. This project will also be taking a piece of municipal property that was tax exempt and turning it into a revenue positive property, generating $570,000 a year for the village. Now this is a huge additional revenue when you consider that our budget is $33.5 million and our tax levy itself is about $22 million. So the revenue from Third and Valley, you can think about it one of two ways. One, the revenue from that project is about almost 1.5% of our entire budget just in that one project. The other way you can think about it is if we had to raise that amount of money, that $570,000 through new taxes, each homeowner would see a property tax increase of $116.89. So that's the positive net benefit potentially on every homeowner with each of these projects that come online. And that's just one project, $116. So think about as we continue to do that and as we continue to infill in downtown South Orange. From a larger development perspective, the future of population growth, especially in New Jersey, shows that people are moving towards more transit-focused urban-suburban environments like South Orange. People want to be able to walk around. They want to be able to move somewhere without a car. They want to live in that kind of environment. And the more that we infill property that's already developed or already impermeable surfaces, basically, the more that we can preserve beautiful spaces in South Orange and in New Jersey that should never, ever be developed on. We've gained recognition statewide on numerous occasions for the smart and sustainable development that we're doing. And the difference in perception out there, when I attend events and meet people or get asked to participate or lead panels or discussions around the state on these issues, it's 180 degrees from what it was. When I came in, I remember having to beg developers to come look at South Orange to try and convince them of the opportunity we all knew was there. And now we're getting an email every week or two from a new developer who's heard about what's happening in South Orange and wants to see what's going on because they're curious about investing in town. And looking at how many existing business owners are reinvesting by opening new business and by fixing and, and upgrading their current businesses, that is an amazing endorsement in the future of this community. And we're doing all of this development as best we can with an eye towards sustainability. Not only do our jitneys run on biodiesel and more and more of our municipal vehicle fleet is made up of fuel efficient and hybrid vehicles, but we're doing major renovations to buildings like Village Hall with an eye towards sustainability by improving HVAC efficiency. Um, and with that building, if we do renovate it and move back in um, with powering that with geothermal. The Third and Valley project will be LEED Silver. And we hope that any future municipal building renovation will earn a LEED certification, something that we could actually require if we wanted to. 
We have electric vehicle chargers in the downtown and now more electric vehicle chargers at the gateway. We have car sharing in our downtown that's been so widely used that Zipcar added a third vehicle recently to the fleet. We're building out a, our complete streets program, tightening regulations around impermeable surfaces, requiring new buildings to have bicycle storage, and we'll even start to have bike racks on our jitneys in the upcoming year. Um, citizens and government are also working together to help residents understand the value and make decisions about solar in their home. Um, the best way I can talk about this collaboration uh, is that one of our former Environmental Commission superstars, Walter Clark, is now a trustee in town and has been able to continue his great work around environmental issues as a trustee, working with, our, um, w working with Howard Levison, for example, on trying to solve our water problems, and working with the Department of Public Works and our engineering office on a number of other projects. And that is just a great example, I think, of someone working um, with the village kind of as a civilian and now as a member fully of the institution of government. Um, I was in Costa Rica in the beginning of January, um, and uh, which I, in this weather, think about more than I should. Um, and I was amazed after riding a motorcycle through the mountains of Costa Rica, I kept seeing wind farms everywhere I went. And I was like, well, this is pretty interesting. So when I got back and found some internet, I looked up a little bit more about where energy comes from in Costa Rica. And it turns out that over 99% of the country's energy comes from renewable sources. Now, it's not fair to make an apples to apples comparison for a small country like that to the United States. But just so you know, the, in the US, it's about 11 or 12% of our energy comes from renewable sources. So it's not completely fair to compare the two, but I think all of us here know that we could do a lot better than 11 or 12%. So what if our federal government can't seem to make the kind of progress that we want to see? Let's show them how it's done by setting an example in South Orange. Let's set our own goal for us to hit regarding where our municipal and town-wide energy use comes from and work towards that. There's over 30 homes um, that have solar installations already and 140 between South Orange and Maplewood that are interested in looking at that system and something that we've spent a lot of time talking about as well. Now it's difficult in South Orange because of most of our architecture doesn't necessarily, of the older buildings, makes it a little difficult to do solar installations. Um, but it's a great conversation to have and a great goal that we could set, again, setting an example in how to be more sustainable. Now, speaking of setting an example, there aren't many places better to look than the South Orange Police Department. So these are crime statistics in South Orange. Thank you, Trustee Clark, for the graphic. Um, <laughs> um, crime is going down in South Orange every year. And last year to this year, we saw around a 20% decrease in one year, most of that in the thefts category, where our officers, especially our detectives, their reputation is known. Our officers are incredibly diligent, our detectives are creative and move fast, and our technology is getting better and better at supporting them and showing people how big of a mistake it is to come to South Orange and commit a crime. Now we could spend the whole night talking about stories from our police department, um, solving crimes, but let me give you just a couple quick examples. There were threats um, made online anonymously directed towards Seton Hall's campus. It ended up being a person out of state that was quickly tracked down through a multi-agency cooperative that was led by the South Orange Police Department. The person was found very soon after. Someone was on Craigslist posing, selling iPhones to people with the intention of robbing the person when they would meet up with them. Again, the person was very quickly tracked down and arrested by the South Orange Police Department. And if you think about what was happening a few years ago with the uh, flash mobs in the downtown, a major part of that was our police department's incredible use of social media tracking and analysis that gave them a heads up when problems were about to arise. Our investments in the police department, which we value so incredibly highly, include strengthening of this technology, buying new cameras which are unbelievably valuable in solving crime, purchasing of new vehicles that are now um, almost all all-wheel all -wheel drive for inclement weather, um, a brand new records management and computer-aided dispatch system, and doing the biggest overhaul to our radio system that's ever been done in this town. That when completed, will literally put South Orange on the cutting edge of public safety communications technology in New Jersey and in the country. Um, some of the other investments include reshuffling space and expanding the work environment for the Detective Bureau, 
starting to fix up several aspects of the police department's headquarters, which were in desperate need of attention, and a process set in motion to, to do a much bigger overhaul. Um, now, I've personally seen many of our police officers, not just as the village president, but also as a volunteer with the rescue squad. They don't hesitate to get their hands dirty and do whatever they can to help. Um, it's worth noting uh, that part of the job of a police officer, right, it's not just catching the bad guys, it's also helping the good guys. Um, there's an officer who's been with our department for 15 years, Nicholas Lanero, um, and I remember uh, we were down on Sloan Street one night when he was working over the summer, um, and uh, there was a handful of people around just hanging out and chatting, and someone asked um, Officer Lanero, you know, what was one of his most memorable moments of being a police officer? Um, the answer was, uh, was pretty moving. Um, so uh, off, uh, about four or five years ago, Officer Lanero spent some time, um, one of his children, um, uh, he had to spend time in his specialty unit in a hospital after one of his children was born. One of the other infants next door to, this, uh, to his kid um, had a medical condition um, that required the use of a trach um, and a lot of respiratory um, interventions. Um, over the time that he spent there, he kind of saw that, you know, here and there. He was an EMT before and picked up little things like that. About a month after he came back to work, there was a call for an infant choking. He arrives on scene. It happened to be in his zone on a day that he was working. He arrives on scene, and the infant that was choking had basically the exact same medical condition that the infant had who was next to him in the hospital. So immediately this officer, although it is well beyond EMT training, police officer training, um, was able to take trach tube, um, insert it into the infant's stoma, take a suction unit, and unblock the, uh, the blockage that was causing the infant to, um, to choke, and he saved that young child's life. And not only is that an amazing story of what our police officers do, and again, I've seen it firsthand on lots of medical calls, but it's also remarkable that that is the first place that one of our officers went to when asked, what's one of your most memorable moments? And I think that that represents the kind of police department we have, that when you think about community policing, that's it. Officers who care so much about this community, that again, it's not just about protecting from a law enforcement perspective, but it's about helping in any way possible. Um, Switching gears to our fire department, um, amazingly, we were recently able to add a, uh, a brand new ladder truck um, to our fleet uh, last year at a very little cost to the village because of some very meticulous grant writing. We've seen a change in leadership as our longtime Chief Jeff Markey retired. And the department has been handed to Acting Chief Dan Sullivan with a permanent appointment imminent, um, which will lead our department through another generation of growth and professionalism. Now, this is a fire department that has literally led the way nationwide with Seton Hall University about fire safety, especially on college campuses. Um, our department, our fire department, went on over 1,800 calls last year, um, including several uh, serious heavy rescue operations for motor vehicle accidents. They do so professionally, they do so competently. They respond to all types of calls, smoke alarms, to down trees, to down wires, to flooding conditions, two medical calls that need rescue operations, and they're there in seconds, ready to assist in whatever way is needed. I've been lucky to be able to be on many calls with them and see how amazing um, of work that they do, both knocking down a fire in minutes so that it doesn't spread to the house 10 feet away, um, or whether it's helping on a medical call save somebody's life. Speaking of life-saving, our rescue squad, um, which is almost entirely donation funded, very the smallest support from the village, operates something truly incredible. And again, I know that from being a volunteer there from 2010, also as the village president. They responded to more calls last year than years in the past, 1,255 calls, including over 200 to Maplewood, with mutual aid to Newark, West Orange, Milburn, and even Jersey City. They've created a cadet program, bringing dozens of high school students onto shifts teaching them not only really valuable medical information that probably everybody should know, but teaching real leadership skills that you can only learn when someone else's life is in your hands. In addition to the 15,000 volunteer hours the Rescue Squad put in last year, the members find the time to somehow run the organization, participate in drills at Newark Airport, and teach over a dozen classes to schools and community groups on basic first aid, 
mostly for um, younger kids. Our Department of Public Works, um, another busy winter. Um, they don't always get thought about in the Department of Public Safety category, but they certainly deserve to. It's not just salting and plowing and clearing debris so that people can get to work or where you need to go the next day. That's a big part of it. But it's also ensuring that as the storm is happening, in the worst of the weather, that emergency vehicles can get to you if you need them. And outside of that, throughout the year, our DPW collected 1,200 tons of recycling material, which netted us over $150,000 in revenue. They planted 70 new trees, pruned 400, inspected an additional 100, removed 125 trees, and ground 100 stumps. And part of this is in reaction to the damage that the old and ailing trees that everybody remember caused during the storms in 2011 and 2012. And our DPW is going to continue to be proactive and vigilant about inspecting and fixing where necessary. We also have DPW to thank working with our engineering office for all, they've worked, all the work that they've done to help beautify and improve many of our parks um, playgrounds and public spaces, especially downtown. Our public library, um, which as we find ourselves in a constant mission to provide equitable access to information and opportunity, finds itself in a more and more important position in our society every year, and in fact is on its 150th year in South Orange. Um, last year, 10,250 people attended 515 library programs in addition to 50 programs held by community groups in the library. And a whopping 77,800 items were checked out, about 6% of which were downloaded. On top of that, the reference desk answered 13,000 questions and 1,200 new library cards were issued. In fact, I need to renew mine. Um, our administration and finance office is one of the most streamlined in local government. The people working there are constantly trying to find ways to make things work better, to use less paper, to optimize how quickly data is processed and checks are cut. All these optimizations saving us time and money. And working together with our board, most notably Howard Levison from the Finance and IT Committee, we've restructured our long-term debt to take advantage of historically low interest rates, saving taxpayers literally millions of dollars over the life of our debt. We've also implemented a debt reduction policy where we've paid down at least half a million dollars more in debt than new debt authorized for three years in a row, and 2015 will make a fourth year in a row that we are responsibly paying down our debt instead of adding to it. Working with Trustee Davis Ford, Chair of the Legal and Personnel Committee, our administration has also overhauled our personnel policy manual, upgraded our employee performance evaluation program, encouraged much more professional development and training in our staff. We've also increased accountability for our staff and Im implemented a single source employer medical relationship for pre-employment phys physicals, worker comp injuries, and sick leave verification, and the result is a dramatic reduction of lost work days. Our IT department has built out a hardware infrastructure that allows us to power the mobile data usage that is getting more and more built into the operations of our police department, fire department, code enforcement, and others who can use computers and tablets out on the road to access information and sync information. And our IT backbone and experience has led us to be able to provide IT services for the Township of Maplewood, whose IT department is our IT department. Um, and we've only been able to do that because of the incredible investment in our IT infrastructure that we've made. And as we try and do our best to be leading regional cost sharing, we're certainly looking at our IT department being able to do that service for other towns as well. So if you know one that needs IT services, let us know. Um, now as we modernize the IT department and all of our IT functions, this brings about modernization everywhere else in the, t in the village. Our village codes, many of which have been out of date and disorganized, are being brought up um, to moderate standards through a complete recodification process, at the same time improving many of our internal regulations and policies. Agendas will soon be entirely created electronically, and the packets and supporting information will be part of a program, a cloud-based workflow, that will eliminate the paper from the process entirely, making the agenda creation process easier, making it even easier to access public documents even quicker after public meetings, and even syncing our agendas to our videos um, of our board meetings. And much of that um, in, in conjunction with also upgrading our entire records management system called Laserfiche, which is how most people access records, and much of that is being led and run out of our clerk's office. Our engineering department continues to improve in our infrastructure, 
reconstructing and repaving roads, and overseeing improvement to our buildings, facilities, and parks all around town. Our building department has seen record years, with business booming from all of the redevelopment activity that I talked about before, um, and also a few really large projects at Seton Hall University. In fact, building department revenues have risen from about $350,000 in 2011 to over $1 million in 2014. Now that's important, not just because of the revenue, but to show how remarkably active people are in investing back into the town and into their properties in South Orange. Our Rec and Cultural Affairs Department continues to host amazing art projects and galleries through the Piero Gallery and offer sports, programming, classes, and activities that meet the needs of our residents of all different ages, young and old, and they assist in some of our most well-attended public events around town. Our tax department, under the direction of our tax collector, while not always seen, not always seen publicly, um, is vital to our operations and continues to excel, routinely boasting tax collection rates above 99%, much higher than many local governments. And also, while not uh, a department itself, uh, an equally important part of our success derives from the expertise, advice, and hard work of our village professionals and advisors, our village council, our redevelopment council, um, our planner, and all of our other professionals. And we're doing all of this great stuff while we're having fun. Our relatively new South Orange Village Center Alliance and its working groups are keeping the downtown clean, helping businesses renovate and new ones move in, and the really exciting part, helping us do a ton of fantastic events downtown. Play day in the downtown, how many people went? Maybe a little show of hands, all right. Um, will definitely become, hopefully, one of the SOVCA's signature events. It was a massive success, as was the historic softball game played. We also had a food truck festival on Irvington Ave, which brought out between 2,500 and 3,000 people out in and out of town to an area of town that they perhaps maybe have never visited before and didn't know it was teeming with all of these great new businesses. We've had more first this year, too. Our first official volunteer appreciation event, thanking some of the people who stood up before. We had our first menorah lighting in a long time, alongside our Christmas tree lighting. And of course, our movies in the park, downtown after sundown, and concerts in the park over the summer brought in record attendance levels, and were just a hell of a good time. Um, and can't wait to be able to do them again. Um, and speaking of record attendance levels, the South Orange Performing Arts Center, this beautiful building that we're in today, has improved not only how efficiently it operates as an organization, but has dramatically improved the programming it offers. Um, it's gotten more grants, it's supported more local arts and programming in town, and it's becoming more and more of an institution in South Orange that I sort of have trouble remembering what it was like before SOPAC existed. And if you get really bored, you can just walk out, the movie theaters are right there. I won't hold it against you. Um, now all of this just scratches the surface of how much our employees do on a regular basis. So there's one way that I want to sum this section up, um, which is this number. Not how old I was when I was elected. Uh, it's not how many minutes are left, unfortunately. Uh, it might be the temperature outside. I wrote that as a joke, but it might actually be lower than that. Um, this number is the number of pennies it costs each homeowner per hour for police services. It's 19 cents per homeowner per hour. So that's about a half a dozen patrol officers, more detectives, dispatchers, and clerical staff all working, and doing so in an incredibly professional and community conscious way. It's about $4.62 per day per homeowner. So for about what most people pay for home TV and internet on a monthly basis, you get not just the benefit of having police ready to respond in seconds to your 911 call, but the value of living in a community where most criminals know not a good idea to come here and commit crime. So when I was thinking about this and when I was thinking about this number, it makes it very hard for me not to believe in what collective action through our government can accomplish. There are people out there in the world and even a few in this community who do nothing but talk about the problems with government and they attack anyone who tries to defend the potential of what government can do if done right. But in the constant desire to paint a bad picture or attack people who are trying to help, they miss the real story. The real story is what happens when things go right, how we learn from them, how we create more from them. Simply, it's the story of progress. Now there's a reality still, of course, that when you add everything up, 
the cost, the counties, the schools, the municipal tax portion, the taxes are high, no doubt. And although I hope I've outlined both the ways in which we've helped cut costs and bring new revenue in, I do believe that most people live here because they understand the value of what this community is. As someone who's lived in Maplewood and South Orange pretty much my whole life, I know I am who I am today in large part, not just due to my family, who's sitting back there and I can embarrass my mom and dad and my sister for a second, um, but also for living in this kind of community. The value is priceless. Um, now speaking of what an entire community is worth, I want to move into a little bit of a conceptual and philosophical, what I would call an adventure, though people might disagree with that word. Um, so this is the state of the village now, the big V village, the big G government. Most of what you've heard so far tonight can be thought about as the output side. We heard about the incredible performance of the institution of government that we have and just a taste of our plans for how we're going to keep improving it. Tonight, again, barely scratches the surface of how much work is going on in the village. But like I said before, that's only one part of the picture. Talking about the institution of government is like treating the symptoms, not the causes. The other side is how we can think about the broader picture, which you can basically think about as the input. How does the institution get created? Basically, what's all the stuff that happens that allows us to have all that great stuff that we just talked about? It's difficult to talk about, it's kind of difficult to understand, and it's very difficult to measure. But I'm going to do our best before we leave here tonight to briefly walk us through that. Now, there's an incredibly basic starting point that's worth mentioning as basically a framework for what's to follow. The basic framework is this. You have people who live in a particular environment. They don't necessarily interact with it. They don't necessarily participate it. You go to work, have dinner, go to sleep, wake up, go back to work, do that, repeat every day. Then there's people who understand their environment. They interact with it a little bit. Um, they maybe can change it a little bit here or there. They also understand that they don't understand all of it. They know there are things that they don't know about, right? Then there are people who get the idea that this environment in which they live is something that they actually have control over. And then you get to that last point, which is people who take an active role in shaping that environment around them and being leaders, whether it's in their own personal lives, whether it's in their family lives, their friends' lives, their work lives, or their community's lives. We don't have a great understanding of how people walk down that pathway to get to a point from where they're being governed to where they're doing the governing. But it's something that we need to spend a little bit of time thinking about tonight. Now, several years ago, it was not uncommon to have a dozen or more people at our board meetings, sometimes up to 100 when a specific issue arose. Often people had very specific feedback, usually in the form of a complaint or request for some type of service. The meetings were longer, and we spent more time in closed session behind closed doors as well. We fielded more complaints at our board meetings, things that probably could have been resolved without the person having to take off from wherever they were on a Monday night, come out, stand in front of an audience, be on TV, stand in front of us on a dais in kind of an oppositional and daunting for many people environment. These days, it's not uncommon for our board meetings, if there are people there, sometimes we go several meetings where there are no public comments, or there's only one or two. Even when we're taking action on very well publicized, important topics. So what happened? Did our entire town become apathetic in the last couple years? Do we do everything perfect? I think something much more interesting happened. I believe what has happened in South Orange over the past few years is we've begun to transform the culture of the big G government. We don't need to think about government here as just a place to go to complain when something doesn't work right. The example I always like to use is it's like a vending machine. But you have your vending machine, you put your money in, you select what you want, and then you wait for the thing to drop and pull it out, hoping it doesn't get stuck on one of the little wire thingies. And if it does, you grab the vending machine and you shake it to get what you paid for out of it. That's how a lot of people treat government. Put your money in, you put your taxes in, you expect your services. When something doesn't happen, you shake it until you get your service out. Um, but now, more than ever, our government isn't a vending machine like that. It's not a place that you go to to shake when you don't get something that you want. 
Rather, it's a place you can go to when you have an idea on how to improve something. It's a place you can go to participate and to add value to your surroundings and derive some value for yourself as well. Now, you can't just go into some place, right, and wave a magic wand and make it productive where all these people are now dividing projects up, working together, setting goals, following through on them, keeping track of everything and doing that in a collaborative way. It's something that everyone who's a leader in the system has to be on board with and has to be able to set the right example for everyone else. We haven't always had that with our governing body, but we do right now. We have an example being set by every single one of our governing body members that communicates that value of collaboration to people who live in town. Um, the idea is those people who may have had those complaints, those frustrations, they see the government not as something that prevents them from getting to a solution, but as a tool that actually helps them get there if they're willing to participate and add their time and their value to the process. Even if the organization needs some real serious TLC, rather than abandoning it, calling for its destruction, or constantly talking about its worthlessness or inability to do things, which is how some people approach government, that's not the value anymore. That attitude doesn't get us anywhere. Not only does it not get us anywhere, it creates an environment of negativity that actively contributes to things getting worse. Because as a person, thinking about getting involved in helping, if that thing that you want to get involved in help with, other people are just bashing and saying terrible things about, why would you want to participate in that? For fear of being lumped in with all of those bad things. Or just because you've now been convinced that it can't work. But those aren't the mainstream values anymore, not here in South Orange. Rather, the values, again, seem to be respecting the process and the institution, even if that means being critical of it, because the goals are advancement, collaboration, and progress, with the understanding that this government is ours to control as we see fit. And if we want to use it towards making things better, well, that's our fundamental right and our fundamental responsibility not just as Americans in this democracy, but as community members here in South Orange, to do just that. Now, we could count how many people are on committees, and we can count how active they are. Committees, um, active being an important distinction just itself. Um, we've got the Public Information and Marketing Committee, our existing statutory boards, the Library Board, the Friends of the Library, the Community Coalition on Race, the Community Relations Committee, the Environmental Commission, the newly renamed Seton Village Advisory Committee, the unbelievably successful South Orange Village Center Alliance, all of its working groups, the Transportation Advisory Committee, the Senior Citizens Committee, the Development Committee, and so many single issue ad hoc committees that we create and involve residents on when we need to make a large decision. And I could go on. Now we could count all of those people up that are participating in those in the hundreds. We could count the number of people that are participating in Neighborhood Watch and large thanks to Janine Buckner, and that's probably in the thousands. We could count the number of people that are involved in neighborhood associations, especially taking advantage of new technologies like Nextdoor. But this is not about the numbers. This is not about the quantity. This is about the quality. We have a community that genuinely values itself, and values being active, and values being constructive, and values the role that they as residents and we as an institution can play working together. This is not a small feat, and it's not something that is just important to think about just within our borders of South Orange. Our community, to some extent, has always had those values. It's one of the things that makes us unique. And now our political leaders, the people that stood up in the room before, have those values 100% as well. And that is bringing more and more people into the process every single day. And let's take a moment to place this culture of constructiveness and collaboration in a larger context. Obviously, this has massive benefit to South Orange. Um, obviously, much of the work that we've talked about, that I've talked about tonight, was due in large part to residents that have been involved. And it couldn't have been done without the productive and collaborative elected officials or the productive and collaborative residents and community members. But there's something even bigger than that. Collectively, 
we as a state, as a nation, and as a world are facing some unbelievable challenges. Every day, these challenges seem to multiply in their quantity, in their seriousness, in their complexity, and in their consequences to us and to future generations. Every day, I know everybody in this room reads about things that fit into that. Let's be real. Between urban violence here in the US and abroad, taking the lives of tens of thousands of people a year just in cities in the US alone, between that violence that wrecks economic opportunity for people who need it most, between poverty and lack of access to food, shelter, and clean drinking water, a state, a country, and a world where there's simultaneously hunger and starvation, as well as crazy food obsession and obesity, urban overcrowding, major infrastructure problems that seriously threaten our safety and our future economic security, ethnic, religious, or other historical disputes around the world that seem to be intensifying and that subsequently drive political extremism elsewhere in the world, warfare that is becoming more deadly, less accountable, and more easily proliferated, technology that is changing the very nature of our existence, our thinking, our interactions, slowly changing what it means to be human, and how much are we talking about that? And an entire planet that we live on that is reacting to the way, to the industrialized way that we live on it, that could have the most serious potential consequences for us and future generations. I could go on. All of these things are real. They're all happening right now. No matter how much we may not feel part of each and one of those, we some of those problems are just miles down the road. Some of those problems are thousands of miles across the world. But they're real and they're happening. Yet, somehow, as these massive and real problems grow, and somehow as our ability to learn grows, and somehow as our access to knowledge and science and data grows, and somehow as our ability to quickly access and talk to people from other parts of the world and other culture grows, somehow our institutions of government especially at larger levels, appear less and less capable of actually doing anything about it. Our leaders appear to be more divided as they are forced often to posture for their party's self-interest or run for re-election in political environments that are superficial, drowning with anonymous money, or just downright bloodthirsty, as many people attempt to hijack our democratic system for their own interests, leaving the rest of us fighting to hold on for the good guys. And our citizens, they appear to be becoming more civically apathetic as they lose faith in the very leaders and institutions that are supposed to be bringing us together and supposed to be driving progress forward, not dividing us and not making us take a step backwards. Frankly, I think many of us on a daily basis simply feel overwhelmed with the number of these problems and the complexity that exist. We're not really sure exactly why we feel overwhelmed, but we do. We're not exactly sure what to do about it, but we know it's there. We haven't even figured out how to talk about these things. In the United States, every 12 minutes, somebody commits suicide. And how, how can we have everything that we do? How can we be so connected as we claim to be? How can we be so developed as we consider ourselves? that still, every 12 minutes in this country, someone takes their own life. A number that's even higher for people who've already sacrificed so much in the military. So how does this happen? And what does that have to do with South Orange? Well, to start, we all obviously live in this world. And whether we want to believe it or not, or think about it or not, all of these things I just talked about are not only monumentally important on their own terms, but they impact our lives and the lives of generations that will come after us and in ways that deserve the most urgent attention. But although most of, many of these, these problems exist, the leadership environments at larger levels, the places where problems are supposed to be solved, are more often than not echo chambers filled with empty rhetoric based on anger, hatred, and intentional divisiveness that only gets us further from a solution. It's not just about the impact that all of these issues have on us. That's not why it's important to South Orange. It's about the impact that we have to have on all of those issues. Now, 
there are a few people that drive political discourse um, the way I mentioned in this town. Not many. Maybe a half a dozen or a dozen. Um, and although they still go about their lives in a fashion that's built on divisiveness and do things like generally pursue a line of public and often anonymous online discussion that is entirely focused on the negative and entirely driven by anger towards everything and everyone with whom they disagree. Those people are not here tonight. <laughs> and no longer do they play a role in shaping the future of this town. The anger, the intentional dividing of people, the personal attacks, the hatred, the backstabbing, the egoism, things that most of us have come to expect in politics don't really exist in our political environment in South Orange anymore. It's been replaced by something much better. Residents, business owners, and students, and elected officials, and other community members who value constructive critical feedback. Honesty, fact-finding, responsibility, duty, community, and collective progress. These are their values, and their goals are a better South Orange. That's why these people are involved. Not, not for themselves, not for one interest group, but because they believe in the future and they believe in constantly improving South Orange through the institution, using it as a tool to achieve that progress. And that is incredible. This culture of big G government, our collective actions, and what we incentivize and what we allow and what we value as a community and how these ideas and values are codified into policy and the institution that carries out these policies, this is an outlier. For sure. It's not normal. It hasn't always existed in South Orange, even since I've been here. And it doesn't exist in many places. But that's why it needs to be talked about. Although our responsibility is to encourage this kind of respectful and collaborative culture here in South Orange, our responsibility does not end where the next town's border begins. We don't live in a vacuum. And because we are living in a world and in a country where the government with a big G or little g appears incapable right now of doing what we're doing, we have to tell our story. This isn't about marketing, this isn't about spin, this isn't about photo ops, or anything along those lines that some people who don't understand the true meaning of why we're all here sometimes call it. It's not even about any one of us in this room. It's about the role that each of us plays in the larger story. This is a story of a culture of real collaboration and real respect where when you know you're doing something right, you don't protect it and hold it close to wield the power that comes with owning that resource, but rather you take that information and you tell the world. You write to people, you tweet at people, you email people, you shout it from the rooftops. You do everything in your power, which in 2015 we have a lot of, to shine light on an example of good government when you find it in an effort to help others do the same. That's what we're all here to do, all of us. Figure out what good government means, whether it's decreasing property taxes, whether it's finding a more efficient way to recycle, whether it's finding better ways to get volunteers involved, whether it's new technology at the police department. We have to figure out, our job is to figure out those things. Our job is to bring people into the process of figuring out those things and find a role for anyone who wants to use this institution to forward those goals. And we have tremendous human capital in this community to do that. That's the input side, the big G government. And then our job in the little g government, the institution, is to get it done. And we have the employees to do that. And then the job, all of our jobs, is to tell that story, as I'm attempting to do here tonight. We've shown that when you have the right input, a community, a governing body committed to collaboration, committed to progress, committed to finding ways to work towards goals, not finding ways to divide people, you get the right output, a government that performs exceptionally well. The tax increases are going down and the budget is stabilized. More money and more investment is coming into this down right now than ever before in its history. Crime is going down every single year, and our police are building even more and more trust with our community, not only using their smarts, but using smart technology. 
our entire technology infrastructure is being upgraded and going to be able to support whatever it is we want to use it for in the future. Our employees who are being treated with respect and with dignity are performing incredibly well and put more passion into their jobs when they know they're truly respected. Our roads get plowed unbelievably well. Your kids can find an array of options and things to get involved with at the library or Baird. Our arts and cultural standing is not only becoming more and more known statewide, but this Performing Arts Center is becoming an incredibly well-visited and respected institution within South Orange. Our government operations are more transparent than they have ever been, and I think it's safe to say one of the best in New Jersey and one of the best in the country. And our governing body, oh, our governing body, the driver of so much of this direction is not focused on petty personal squabbles, but is mature and reasonable and productive with every single trustee who was introduced earlier working hard at making a difference, not making a point. And they are responsive, and they are long-term, and they are always willing to put South Orange first. And our community is involved in finding ways to not only derive value for themselves to be act active civic participants, but adding tremendous value and ideas into what we're doing. We have more events in our downtown than we ever have. Um, we're bringing people together physically in an age when sometimes the technology can actually drive us farther apart. We have so many new businesses moving into our downtown, so many existing businesses renovating and reinvesting in our downtown. We have a relationship with Seton Hall University that's more amicable and closer than anyone can remember it being, with excitement and interest not just coming from one group or another, but from elected officials, from residents, from business owners, from students, from faculty, and from administration all at the same time. South Orange is on the map, no doubt, not just as a place where the government is performing well, which is the easy story to tell, but South Orange is on the map as a place where people want to visit, want to move to, want to start their families, and want to be part of because the community is performing well. So yes, I stand here confidently tonight to tell you the state of the village is strong, both the small V village and the big V village. And I am happy to not only report that to you tonight, I am proud and honored and humbled to have the opportunity to participate in all of this with all of you. Not just for what we're doing here in town, but for the example that we are and that we must set for the rest of the state and the rest of the country at a time when they need leaders like all of us. And I'm excited and thrilled and ready for the challenges that we will all face because I know without one drop of uncertainty that by truly working together as we're doing here in South Orange right now, we will meet and overcome all of those challenges. And even the challenges that we don't even know exist yet. Here in South Orange, and beyond our borders. And in doing that, we will show people who don't yet know the power inside each of them and all of them together that they do have the ability to shape the world around them into what we all dream it to be. So thank you to everyone for being here tonight and those of you watching at home for contributing to what we have here. Because this would not be possible without everybody in this community. But our job is nowhere near done. No matter what role any of us plays in the process, we still have a lot to do. And I thank you for your service and your commitment to a better village and ultimately a better world. The state of the village is strong, and I know and trust it will become stronger thanks to all of you. Thank you. So everybody has to sign up to volunteer on the way out, yeah. <laughs> if you're not already. <laughs>